Thank you to everyone who is helping us with our transcripts. You're doing a great job helping us make sure they're published together with the podcast. If you'd also like to help out with publishing the podcast, just email us, hey at uxpodcast.com, A-T-Y or H-E-J. UX Podcast Episode 251. Hello, I'm Pat Axpo. And I'm James Roy Lawson. This is UX Podcast. We're in Stockholm, Sweden, and you're listening in 197 countries and territories in the world, from Germany to Belize. Cheryl Platz is a designer, speaker, and actor. She designs complex interfaces for screens and machines, known for her cutting-edge work on Amazon's Alexa, the Sims series of games, and Microsoft's Azure platform. Cheryl is now also an author having just released her book, Design Beyond Devices, Creating Multimodal Cross-Device Experiences. In her book, we learn how to go beyond screens, keyboards, and touchscreens by letting your customers' humanity drive the experience. We're delighted to have Cheryl on the show, teaching all of us how to stay relevant and keep up with the future that is already here. Stay tuned after our chat with Cheryl for our post-interview reflections. I've been reflecting back on episodes that you and I have done over the years, and I remember us really early on talking about smart speakers, and and you were upset about the fact that it's, I mean, how will it work with families? How will that work when when all of us are speaking, and who who has the loudest voice, or who does it listen to first? I mean, things like that, and those types of problems um, I haven't really seen or heard anyone deal with until I read Shell's, Shell's book. And, and I think one of the sentences in the, in the beginning of the book that really, really resonated with me is, more than ever, we need to question everything because the world we were trained for no longer exists. And this is like, it feels like this is the why of you, why you wrote the book. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I have such fond memories of my training at, at Carnegie Mellon in human computer interaction, and I'm very, I'm very grateful for it. But like, my senior project was on Palm Pilots. Like, it could not be farther from what we do today. I, aside from like, I guess there's still styluses around, uh, but nothing about multiple users at the same time. Nothing about hands-free interaction. Nothing about uh, like. Uh, the, the, the gap is so large, but even people who trained five years ago, uh, I mean, I get the, the Echo was just sort of coming into the market then and people weren't sure if it was a fad. I'm pretty sure most schools weren't teaching it yet. Um, and even if they were, it was still pretty much, despite the uh, entertaining ad that introduced the Echo, uh, the Echo didn't work like that, as you say, like the, it does, didn't support families, still doesn't really natively support like a natural conversation. I thought there was some really good work at uh, Interaction 18. Uh, Somebody, I believe from uh, the United Kingdom had gone through and done a research study where they worked with transcripts from families talking to to the Echo and it was just a mess, right? Like just incomplete conversations and spaghetti strings of of context. Uh, Life is messy. Like, life is full of people, even office contacts, right? This year, everything has changed. You can't assume that people are in a quiet environment or a one-on-one environment. Uh, And so I'm glad it resonates with you because many times in my career, I felt like I'm in uncharted waters and I know how it feels to be, to just kind of feel like, well, what the heck do I do? No one, to- no one told me what to do for this. Is there a solution? Uh, and the only way I've gotten through is is approach- approaching these problems and saying like, well, what would I do if it was solvable? And this book is the the results of that approach, is, is approaching these tough problems and saying like, okay, I'm going to assume it's solvable and, and we'll, just, we'll just try. And some things have worked and some things, uh, some things are a little bit more hypothesis and some things I've got evidence on. But I think, uh, I, hope it's, I hope this is useful for folks as we head into a very uncharted age. I think maybe that's it. Maybe, maybe our, our industry is is destined doomed destined to you know always have this feeling of what we learned 
is no longer kind of what counts anymore. I mean, it's, it's. I think we're probably always going to be in that, um, that, that trapped in that way of working. I think. And it was frustrating at Amazon because uh, I was at Amazon in, fi- in 2015 and 16 working on Echo when it was still pretty early. But, you know, we were working on the Echo show at the time. Like we knew we were going multimodal, like the full, full force. Um, and I was trying to ch- trying to like get people thinking about some of the concepts in this book already. Like, hey, we kind of need a spectrum. We need to talk like we need to share a shared language for talking about like when we use different uh, different types of multimodality and what they are like when we choose to do like full voice versus sort of like partial voice and then file over to screen but people were re- running so fast they weren't ready for that uh, it's very hard for us to take step back and do a systems design person to take on all of this um, and I get that too which is another reason why the book's out there is like I get it it's really like complicated and you're probably not staffed to do this work so let me let me do some of the heavy lifting for you because mm. I've been there too so let's 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 just take a step back a, a moment and answer the question, which I know you will have been asked several times before: is is what is multimodal or multimodality? Yes, yes, uh, and <laughs> it has so many meanings, uh, and which I, it was funny. It's it's always been kind of clear in my head, and then when I went out and looked, as many designers have encountered at multiple times in their career, uh, it was not as clear as I thought. Mm. Uh, at, at its most basic uh, and, and non-formal multimodality, as this book operates, is a system that supports multiple t- modes of or modalities of interaction, both um, output and input. Um, usually it's both, both output and input. Technically, you could have a multimodal system that only has a screen and, you know, supports touch and voice. But the thing about it is, like, if a system, spe- you know, and, and you could also have the, the converse where a system speaks to you, but you have to type to it. But especially when you get into things like voice, uh, there's a lot of research that indicates that our brains interpret speech as, uh, you know, another human talking to us and so not speaking back and forth violates a social contract so that's a whole other thing uh so usually if if voice is involved you're probably doing some kind of visual and voice like technically the echo is multimodal because there's an led and uh and that's uh and that's not always you can't always assume someone's looking at it and so that's one part of what I call the multimodal interaction model you need to take into account. Like if you're totally hands-free, it's important what you can and can't assume. Like I can't assume in a hands-free system that I'm looking at a device and I can't assume that it's in arm's reach. Uh, So that stuff can be bonus. Like the echo has a button on it where you can like make it stop the alarm noise. So if it's near me, I could do that, but I can't assume that's the only way people are going to interact with the system. And same with the LEDs, uh, like it can, you know, it can give you reinforcement, but that can't be the only way we impart information to you. So multimodality is that, that bi-directional and sort of not infinite, but a system with many possibilities. Yeah, so but you can there's... you can be there can be many ways of inputting, and there can be many ways of outputting, but they don't all have to be in use at the same time or in the same period of time. Yes, I guess. and I'm glad, and and that's a really good question too because it it gets there's different types of multimodality, like different uh, different approaches. So you could do sequential multi multimodality where you're kind of like okay. I am working with keyboard and mouse now, and I'm going to switch modes, and now we are going to talk to the machine, and it's just talking, and then I'm going to go back to keyboard and mouse. You could do uh, simultaneous multimodality, which we were trying to experiment with on Windows Automotive, where you like say, I want to go to there, and at the same time, I'm literally touching a point on the screen, which, which corresponds to there. Um, that's a lot more complicated, and it's a lot more costly, and you kind of need to know what the cost benefit is for doing that it's like a holy grail but i understand it's costly so we need to know why we're doing it and then there's sort of orchestrated uh multimodality where you let people you you make it really easy for people to do whatever they want in the moment uh the sequential model usually isn't super flexible like people let you move the way i see that a lot of the time is uh like early echo there were parts of the 
out of box experience you had to do from an app. So it was multimodal because they didn't have a good way to do Wi-Fi passwords. Uh, so you just, that was, and I, they may still do that. I haven't set up an Echo in a while. <clears throat> Uh, so that's that's a sequential thing you had to you can do voice and then you have to go to the app and then you come back uh, orchestrated experience would be like they have multiple ways to get you through the out of box experience so you could do voice or you could do touch and it's up to the customer to choose what's right for them in the moment and that has to do with accessibility i think you point out in the book i mean if you if you require an input i mean that that's worse for accessibility but if you allow more than one input, that's better for accessibility. Yes, mm -hmm. such a great point. Because I, I had this like crisis mm -hmm. of faith. What, like when you start working on on product like smart speakers, there's this moment where you're like, "We're doing such great stuff for humanity. We're including folks who have been excluded for a while." And then you start hearing cries of like voice first and voice only. You're like, "Well, wait, mm -hmm. aren't we just leaving?" the the previous folks out mm. like the folks who the screens included mm. and touch so if you're anytime you're requiring one modality only you're leaving someone behind so the mm. more you can get to an orchestrated experience the more inclusive you're going to be i understand it's complicated i totally get it mm. it's a lot uh, that's that's part of why my book is so long but yeah. uh that's <laughs> but it's it's important and if you can get there it's it's it changes lives, especially like if if your system deals with something that people deal with every day, it can it can really make a difference to provide that flexibility. Is there is there a, um, a point where, or is there is there a definition of where inputs can be must be um, active inputs or can there be passive inputs? I'm just wondering about the whole thing with with when I'm knowingly giving instructions inputs to something and when it's passive data collection, but also an important part of the in of the modal multimodal experience did i make that question complicated too complicated yeah let's let's re rephrase it for me please right okay we'll start again look so so basically maybe if you your speaker's listening and it can tell these multiple people in the room then it's it's understanding it's listen, it's it's input but it's not an active kind of command it's passive information it's picking up that it would then maybe use to help <laughs> the situation yeah that's that's a whole bucket of questions around <laughs> trust and and uh feasibility and uh desirability and that's technically possible and a lot of people believe and there i believe there's some proof that some phones do this already if it, depending on your settings that like oh i talked about you know french fries and now facebook's just recommending like burger joints to me uh and, you know, when people t have that conversation, it's rarely in a positive light. Uh, and a lot of the current voice uh, assistants have some form of fail, fail safe in place to prevent ambient listening, the, usually the, the wake word. But I do always encourage people when they ask me to to challenge the, the the manufacturers of devices they make, like be familiar with the privacy uh, controls, like the, the wake words could go away at some point and it could be billed as this great uh, removal of friction from the process. But then where, how do you know that folks, are, the, the devices aren't listening and trying to make act, take action on ambient cues that they've heard? Like if we ever get to that point, um, customers will have a great additional cognitive burden learning about what those devices are doing with the potential ambient understanding that they're receiving. Um, I, I like the wake word. <laughs> I don't know if that, may, that makes me old fashioned. Uh, we'll see how folks relate if we ever get mm. to the point where, because it, you know, it's just a switch. Like you could turn off the wake word, the, like the, they could do that. Um, they haven't really moved away from that. And it's kind of the special sauce that that enabled the echo to get to to be welcomed into people's homes, and I know uh, that was a lot of the development that Amazon put into the echo originally was how can we do some processing locally so we're not just arbitrarily sending all people's speech into the cloud. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, there's if you're in a trusted environment, yeah, you could if if you consent and and you're okay with it, like there's a lot you could potentially gather from ambient listening. Um, if you could sort out who is speaking mm. and 
uh, if you had really clear microphone arrays, because uh, the, the further you get, the more things get messy. The interesting thing about, and this kind of goes back to Pear's point earlier, uh, there's been some form of speaker recognition for a while on uh, on the Echo and I believe on Google, uh, but we haven't got to the point where it's really these devices that are voice interaction enabled are really fluidly detecting who's speaking at any one time. Um, per, not and certainly not within a single conversation. It's mostly to like switch profiles, and it's even not really good at that. Like our Alexa has never been able to tell the difference between me and my husband, and he's a trained Shakespearean actor and a like, baritone, and I'm like a soprano, huh. and I don't know what's going on with that. Uh, but okay, <laughs> so it's weird because I know some the, the technology to do the separation and to maybe be able to deal with a multi-user scenario really fluidly and understand. Well, mom said she wanted to watch uh, Moulin Rouge, and dad said he wanted to watch Transformers. Uh, what you know? How are we going to to disambiguate those two choices? Um, the technology is technically there; it's not perfect, but I haven't seen much play with it with that rich multi-user interaction. Because yeah, I mean, I've I've read about um, I've read about like isn't your voice is effectively a fingerprint, isn't it? I mean, you yes. So you'd think if you if you've come to the point of saying, well, your voice is a fingerprint, then you'd be able to kind of get that out of the sound recording somehow and say, oh, ah, it's Cheryl speaking. And to, to get to full voice printing, and we that was another like holy grail for us in Windows Automotive, uh, that's uh, still a little processor intensive for a lot of the smart speakers today. So we could, um, and for the automotive interfaces at the time, we were designing back in like 2013. Um, so like voice is a, a truly biometric identity unit. Uh, none of these devices have that level of di disambiguation yet. So they instead they have this voice profile or voice uh, login thing where it's differentiating basically on pitch and, you know, other like possibly prosody and other qualities of the voice, but it's not biometric quality. Like mm -hmm. it wouldn't, like if there's so, like another woman with the same pitch, it would probably uh, not be able to distinguish us. And it can't even distinguish me and my husband. So <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, the FBI would not use it for uh, voice printing. No, <laughs> no James Bond and uh, Alexa. <laughs> that makes me think of, I mean, I, I was on a call earlier today and uh, someone was complaining about how he has more and more smart devices. I mean, there are microphones in everything now. And mm -hmm. when he uses his wake words, Several devices, of course, turn on and want to please him. Uh, and that itself, of course, is becoming a problem. Which, How do the devices know which one he is talking to? Because you have the same wake phrases, usually. I just can imagine minions mm. now. Yeah. You know, all of them, like, <laughs> looking up at the same point. The claw. Yeah. <laughs> it reminds me of when I was working on the Alexa team, and we were they were preparing for the first Super Bowl ad, the one with like Alec Baldwin. Uh, they they he, in the ad he was supposed to like order wheels of pecorino cheese or something, and so we all had an echo on our desk. And if you forgot to mute it, bad things happened because like they were testing the commercial to see like. Uh, a, that the commands were supported and B, like whether the commercial was properly muting itself. And so I would come back to my desk sometimes and like my, or I'd go home and my shopping list would have like 400 wheels of Pecorino cheese. And like, like oh, oh, okay, wow. that's a, that's Amazon problems. Uh, so luckily it wasn't the, it wasn't ordering those. It was just on my shopping list. But yeah, the, the device proliferation thing is a real challenging, I mean, I, I kind of almost see this as like a design ethics problem when we talk about waste and uh, consumption because you know, if in 2015 and 2014 people didn't have far field microphones in their homes so yeah we had to sell speakers now we're at the point where as you say almost everything your laptop your phone your smart speaker there's one in every room you might have multiples they're all far field speakers so is it ethical to continue to sell things with far field speakers is is there a way we can leverage this, the far field speakers that already exist? Could we come up with an interoperability pattern uh, so that these things can work together? Uh, there's the wake word. I will say I like it was smart of the Amazon folks from the beginning to offer multiple wake words so you could kind of hack a light sort of disambiguation. I've never understood why uh, like we didn't do 
at least a little bit with distance, like the the volume of the voice or the proximity, like you can, if you can beam form like the Alexa can, you know, it's got that blue ring and then the light blue ring. So it knows where you are. It probably knows how close you are to the mic too. And if it knows how close you are to the mic, other devices probably know that too. So the one you're closest to should be the one that responds. Um, I don't know that all devices have that level of sophistication, but if you have distance, then and you know you're aware of all the microphones, then it should be just the one that's closest to you that's making the response, and all the other ones should just politely sit and wait their turn. Um, or if you have cameras, then gaze is a really important thing. But you see how like you have to start thinking about context, yes. and that's why the for the second chapter of my book is just all about capturing customer context because. In a multimodal world, it's so, so important to just look more broadly than just like a persona. Like we need, you know, Bill Buxton has talked about the concept of place sonas. And it's like, you need to understand the customer space deeply. Like how many of these devices are they likely to have and where are they likely to have them? Uh, how noisy are their environments? Uh, you know, what is their emotional state and what is their emotional relationship with the device, especially if it's voice enabled? Uh, what is this, what's in their hands uh, and how does that change over time? Time. All of those things are really important when you talk about interacting with like microphones in the home or gesture devices in the home or touch devices in the home or, or at, at work. Um, and I think it, we had a couple of comfortable years in the industry where it was like we could assume it was mobile. And, you know, we, like people just kind of tuned out their surroundings for the most part. <laughs> just like, uh, or we could assume it was the office. And that was a pretty uh, that was a pretty constant environment. But as we've learned in the pandemic, uh, wa as we get this camera view into people's lives, home is a very variable, very variable experience. So, I mean, you, you mentioned a few moments ago interoperability and um, it made me think, can we actually achieve multimodal? without interoperability that these things can actually i mean the, the example you gave with different speakers different places i mean surely we've got to have something some some way some standards to how these all connect we can achieve multimodality with individual devices certainly you know like the uh, google I, I I always lose track of what it's named now. The Google Nest Home Hub, <laughs> the, but the the they've got gesture, they've got voice, they've got touch. Like they're they're cranking on all cylinders to some extent, and that's just a single device. Um, but can we achieve multimodality in an unobtrusive way where six devices aren't responding to you all the time? That's that's the question. And I and also I was thinking, danger. sorry, Sean, I was just thinking as well about um, not just cross pl cross platform um, multimodal interoperability, because yeah. I mean, me and Pair over the years have always joked about the fact that I'm I'm in the Google world app, and then Pair is in the Apple world. And if you know you are in one or the other. And it's yeah. it's it's and a lifestyle choice. It's it's you know you can, and it's not practical to even try no, and, and blend the, these. And the more you invest, I mean, the, the you can't go back. Yeah, and I agree. It, <laughs> it's it's a it's a tough situation. I agree that right now it's not really feasible to mm. to do a multi sort of multi-platform home when it comes to these multi-modal devices. I'm obviously I worked at Amazon. So most of the devices in my home were purchased for, from Amazon. So we're an Amazon household right now. Um, and, and I've thought about bringing some Google devices into the home. And, and I, I just, I'm like, I can't, <laughs> That's just that. What what are we gonna do? That's that. It's, it's not that. Hmm. I can't get my head around it, and I work on this stuff. Yeah. So <laughs> it's and and it's sticky too. Like there's a, this huge cost barrier once you've invested in hardware. Uh, so as an industry, we have to deal with that. Like grapple with the thoughts of that. Like, is it good for our industry that everybody's stuck? Hmm. It, is is that truly good? I mean, obviously. Amazon's happy that they've got people who are stuck and Google's happy that they they've got people that are stuck and Apple's happy that they've got people that are stuck but you know how are we as customers that's the question yeah how do yeah. we feel as customers when we're mm. you know we get to the point of feeling trapped mm. <laughs> and you know uh how if if that stagnation is keeping out other competitors those are all US companies mm. that has sometimes ended badly uh, so there's a real question mm. of like 
does it, it, do you need interoperability to uh, avoid antitrust concerns? Mm -hmm. I mean, Google's got some problems coming up on uh, in the horizon, and uh, that's a real question. Um, and would other folks follow suit? Uh, these are these are big questions. Uh, I I've always ho wished that there would be more openness and interoperability in the space. Partially also because of this big paradox around bias, mm. the way each of these systems was spun up, it was in secrecy. So the initial sampling for the natural language corpuses for the uh, voice interaction uh, was basically employees and their families. Uh, which uh, an American families and employees as well. Yeah, yeah. 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 Basically, mm -hmm. uh, occasionally you've got uh, some folks who have like migrated on visas, but they tend to be from specific countries, mm -hmm. uh, and and so, like the gender diversity is not there, the the national diversity is not there. Education the levels are all very high. Yeah, so you, you get this, it, it, and you hear it from customer stories that the the accuracy of the natural language systems are it doesn't reflect the customers, and mm -hmm. so. There's not really a fiscal or there's not really a fiscal incentive to do a massive overhaul of those systems. So I, I kind, I've long been wishing that there would be an entry for smaller players to come in and build more open systems from scratch. Mozilla has been working on that with Project Voice, uh, and I hope that that continues. But they can't just plug their voice recognition engine in to anything right now. It's out there for like independent projects and Raspberry Pi, but mm. uh, kind of stuff, I believe. But how how might we? give people the ability to uh, feel more represented in a world where the big players haven't uh, committed to opening up or expanding or being more interoperable. Mm, mm. I've seen some token efforts. Maybe they're more than token, but like, you know, Google's trying to get folks with that Down syndrome and, do, and engaging with them and trying to get them into their natural language program. Uh, but, you know, I don't see a lot of effort to, like, directly engage with the black community. And there's, like, a whole other, like, language structures and, uh, like, in regional intonations and things. And I feel like not engaging directly with them may be, it, like, implicit bias uh, or unconscious bias. I feel like that that deserves as much attention, especially in the States. It's tough. Uh, mm. So, but... I, you know, the, the big players would say like, oh, is that making us money? Well, if you were more interoperable or more open, maybe smaller players could come in and help cover that gap. Um, a healthier ecosystem could help do that. Yeah, uh, I think uh, thinking about in the book, you talk about interrupter, interruption matrix was, was one of the things that you mentioned um, later on in the book about when it's good to interrupt. Um, um, I said, conversation, that's not the right word, is it? Um, uh, well, an uh, activity. That was what I was looking for. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, when you're building an interruption matrix about um, when it isn't isn't a t good time, it's it's not just a personal interruption matrix. Ultimately, it's it's a cultural one. Because like what what might be um, culturally okay in one particular society might be really really not something you do in another. Um, Maybe the maybe the interoperability is, is something that could help fill the cultural gaps. Yes, that too. And I will say that I like I was happy to see that when we were working on the Amazon Echo, like Amazon would spin up voice teams in the countries in which they were launching. Uh, so that's that's and they weren't shipping designers over; they were hiring local folks to get some of the regional perspective. Uh, but but yeah, there's so much especially when you get into natural user interfaces, when you're moving beyond typing and mouse clicking, everything becomes cultural. Uh, everything from like what hand gestures are appropriate to what language we use and the intonation we use. And uh, some cultures don't like accepting directions from women. There's a story in uh, yeah. the this book, Wired from Speech, about that uh, <laughs> and BMW. Uh, so that's there's a lot to unpack there. Yeah. Uh, we won't do that here, but... Uh, so, yes, interrupting people culturally, like, you know, if we were in a, a region where uh, it was predominantly Muslim, there are times of day that you certainly probably wouldn't want to be dinging with the notification interruption, that you would probably want to be aware and very respectful that, like, just because they're not interacting with mm. you doesn't mean they're available. 
uh, the like the the during prayer intervals and that you don't you don't get that perspective if you're not bringing diverse voices to the table and making sure that you're interacting with the folks in the regions that you're deploying to. Mm. And something I I've experienced quite a lot with my Apple TV is that I actually um have devices set on different languages. So some of my devices are set on Swedish and some on English. And of course, now the Apple TV remote has a voice input, which I appreciate because it's hard to type with the remote. But mm -hmm. uh, I, I have several Apple TVs and I have them on different languages for some reason. And it doesn't tell me which language it is on. So often when I say it in English, I get something that would be the interpretation, well, the <laughs> how it would sound like in Swedish and get a movie for that. Uh, so I'm not prepared for the re <laughs> response, which is really, really confusing. And then I have to spell it out. And sometimes I just go back to keyboard because it just makes it easier because I can't make it sound like it wants me to sound. I can tell you, Per, as well, that in, in well, my car, I have Google Android, um, Google um, Auto. And um, my phone, my Google phone is in English. Um, but generally, I'm, when I'm navigating, when I'm driving to places, I'm driving in Stockholm. Right. So I say the place I want to go to. It won't let me type because I'm driving. It yeah. blocks that from me. Mm. So I have to use a voice interface. Mm. So I say the place and I say it in Swedish because I can speak Swedish and I'm in Sweden. I'm navigating in Stockholm. And it has absolutely no idea. I cannot use Google Maps while I'm driving yeah. because my phone's in English mm. and I'm in Stockholm. Mm. Totally. This this mm. problem came up when we were on Windows Automotive, mm. as you say, James. Like, and uh, pair that was exactly what I was think thinking about. Like, Europe is such a beautiful set of challenges with it, how many cultures and languages are all jammed up next to each other. Uh, and obviously, technologies developed in America don't lead with that. Even though we have so many Spanish speakers, mm. there's a lot to unpack there too. Mm. Uh, but. Uh, yeah, that that when the automotive case mm. is the best example of why you would want a bilingual mm. system. Mm. Like you might also want it just because you're a bilingual household. But the like the way to get at Americans is to talk about that. Like maybe you're in an area <clears throat> that doesn't have, uh, need you know, single language street signs, mm. and mm. it's a challenging problem when you're switching inside a single utterance, multiple languages, because that's additional computational power it's you have to keep both corpuses in in the system at once and i'm not defending the systems but i'm hoping we can get there and we were we were trying to figure out how we would do that in in a car but it was still a little early early at the time i believe we've got to have the technology soon uh, but in in pair's example I, I, I believe that Alexa is getting close, if not there already, where uh, it's starting to support bi bilingual interactions to some extent. But I don't know if it's bilingual in a single utterance, like the car example, or if it's like I can speak to it in either one or the other. But the way language work, like the way spoken language works, I don't see why... If like if in your example where you had spoken English to a Swedish uh, system that was expecting Swedish, if you were able to say, I speak English and Swedish, if you sp speak something in English and it gets but, like really low confidence results, why doesn't it just take an extra second and run that utterance against the Swedish set? Like it, it, it uh, to me, and I'm not deeply engaged in the speech science here, but to me, the computer science there seems like you ran one NLP check, it, the numbers came back bad, you take the same utterance, you just do another NLP check, and then if that's better, uh, you're bilingual. Like, you just, you, you, you seamlessly switched over to the, the other language. That's so weird. I never thought about that, that it's single language. Why is it, why do I only set one language per system? Why don't I yeah. get to right? set more? But, but per, it's this just is a multi-select box. Yeah. If you've got multiple languages, yes. just support them. Yes. But this is this is again about this. Like, I'd really, I really want to have a little box uh. of of information of context that says, "Look, I'm, I'm James. I'm I'm 47 years old. I live in Stockholm. I speak these two languages. I have a wife and two children. There's, you know, one of them's one of them a boy, one of them a girl, and we, you know, just give a bull bag of of basic context so that these systems would have." something to chew on and, and make life a lot better. And you'd expect them to know all about you already. <laughs> From all the data I've given them yes. for free, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's this, it's this dichotomy where we're like, God, we're stuck in a surveillance culture. Mm. It's a really bad surveillance culture because mm. they surveil and yet they don't know anything yeah. about us all yeah. the time. Like, how, how, did, how did 
that happen? How do we get into surveillance hmm. culture where they don't know any of the important things? Yeah. Uh. I said, that, is, that is actually probably the biggest question. Mm. It's kind of we, we're giving so much data all the time, but it's it's been used to give us adverts in kind of like you know news feeds <laughs> that we don't really want to see, <laughs> yeah. and not anything of value. Which, if you wanted to survive, that would be the first thing to do is to offer value, mm. um, and that's the tough part with the the like central profile is like could that data be used in any way against you. Um, I, ideally, it would be super secure and you could just choose who you share it with. Um, and I agree that, like, I, I hate re-entering my data. I, you know, I deal with the disability and I, every time a doctor asks me to onboard to their portal, I know this is probably not a thing you have to deal with because you have lovely universal health care. Uh, we don't. And so every doctor has a different portal you have to sign up with. And when they say, hey, do you want to sign up in their portal? Like the last time that happened, I nearly had a panic attack. I'm like, I don't want to enter my medical history again. Mm. It's the mm. same thing. Don't ask me. Mm. Uh, that's what, So identity is one of the m multimodal traps i point out and privacy in a chapter where it's like when you when you start to expand your system to this complexity uh that sort of question like what what languages does someone speak uh and and what do they need to keep private especially like if you're in a multi-user household uh, those are really tricky questions that you're going to come up against um and i don't have easy answers but it, you have to the point is you need to like be aware that those are pitfalls and ask those tough questions early in the design process when you're building these complex systems. So for, so for the listeners, I mean, what are, what are the most common obstacles or mistakes or failures? And how, what are the, I mean, techniques that you should be employing when you get to these devices? Because most people are used to working with screens and you do prototypes in one way, but now it's like, it's a full body experience in a completely different way as you, promised in in the start of the book we don't know we haven't been taught for this what do we need to know <laughs> well some of the traps i talk about uh we one of them is around ergonomics just fail it's like being so excited about voice and adding it to an existing system that we're not thinking about forcing people back and forth uh it's or same with different types of physical controllers or touch and mouse uh, or gesture and any of these things. Uh, the human body has limits, repetitive use, all of these things. Like if you're not taking into account the impact on the physical body when you move into a multimodal space, uh, you can cause genuine harm. Uh, you know, when I, I even just like working, playing Wii games, there's a game called Cooking Mama and like I genuinely got a shoulder injury from playing that game. Like it was, <laughs> um, and I am very sensitive to like moves between the keyboard and mouse, but that's not even super multimodal there, but switching back and forth between gesture and keyboard would be a lot of movement on the wrist and could potentially be stressful for folks. Uh, so it's important. And if you had like two different types of physical controller, that could be potentially mm. physically stressful for folks. So that's something to keep in mind. And, and uh, I feel like that's one of the things that designers have been most, they've had the luxury of ignoring for so long. They're like, everybody's using a keyboard and mouse or everybody's using a phone. I'm not a human factors person. I don't need to deal with this. Well, we do now in this world. Um, another one of the traps is around uh, context. Uh, you know, if we talk about chatbots, which extend very easily to voice interaction, uh, and when we speak to a device, we expect it to adhere to the social contract because our brains are like, it's a conversation. That means it's a person. The brain's so helpful. Uh, so, we expect our conversational partners to maintain the context of the conversation because otherwise they're not paying attention and that is rude. Uh, so it seems rude when, you know, uh, I, I'm having a conversation with a bot and it's like, how's the weather in Orlando? And then we have that conversation. I'm like, how about, uh, and how about Seattle? And it's like, I'm sorry, what was your question? Like that's, it, it, that, that seems rude, even mm -hmm. though like I, as a developer, I'm like, mm -hmm. well, you didn't tell me what, what you wanted to know about Seattle. Mm -hmm. Like we were talking about weather. 
Uh, mm. And it's a really simple fix there. Mm. You just remember what the last question was. Yeah. So if they don't give you a new question, you just use the last question mm. and the new uh, parameter they gave you. Um, but you need to have those conversations. Like you need to talk early on about what parts of the context of your conversation or your customer's engagement all up are important to maintain and for how long. I mean, the longer you maintain context, the more likely it can be used against your customer. Mm. So you have to be careful. Um, too much context can, can be dangerous. Like you might be inferring too much. So it's uh, context is, is, a, is a complicated concept, but it's important to, uh, to think about what your customers are going to be expecting from you, what, what, what they will believe is appropriate in the situation. Uh, I mentioned identity and privacy. Uh, another one, which is just, I feel like, early days for us, it, it has been a soapbox for me at so many places where I've worked, is discoverability. Right now, uh, in multimodal systems, there's a lot of new stuff, like new ways to interact with the system. Like, how do you, we're so used to like little toasts and bubbles to teach people how to use new, you know, traditional keyboard and mouse software. And we don't have that when you have a voice interface and designers are like, what, how do I do it? <laughs> and, and it's, I still, I still hope that we're going to get more sophisticated than where we are now. I, like Alexa, for example, I mentioned, I, I give a lot of Alexa examples because my household is Alexa, um, not meaning to say that they're the best or the worst by any means. Um, but there was a feature we had talked about when I was working there that's finally made it partially into the system, which was um, I, had, I had been proposing a tag, tag on uh, kind of thing where like, we don't want to interrupt you before your task is complete to tell you about something. That's that's getting between you and your goal. That's obstruction. Don't do it. Mm. But at the end of a successfully completed task, maybe you would be open to some new information. Mm. So um, they finally got that in. So sometimes, uh, like, I'll ask for the weather, uh, you know, f for Seattle for today, and she'll be like, do you want to know it for this weekend? Uh, or she'll yeah. say, did you know you can ask for the weather, you know, or she'll mm. tell me about a new feature. Mm. Which is cool. Like that's that follow on thing is is essentially like one of those little pop ups, mm. one of those little teaching uh, teaching cards. The problem is it's not supported by intelligent awareness of what features I've already used. Hmm. So it's oh, yeah. it's really repetitive. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it, and that's the thing. Like it would always I'd always hoped it would be applied with mm. some level of contextual awareness of the the customer's journey. Uh, but you, you have to have that conversation at the ar architectural level and commit to storing some like what learning like what learning data is important and are we tracking it and then only teach things that they haven't achieved yet you know but, i mean that's something that goes back to the, the human creative interaction stuff we, we we talk about how well mm. you know you've got beginners and then as you use the system more you become more and more experts and you should you should reveal um kind of help and assistance that is um, applicable to the level of the user of the system of the interface and you know we don't do that well enough in in digital interfaces and it's kind of i suppose in that sense not surprising we don't do it very well in voice ones either isn't that yeah. why we killed the microsoft paperclip because it was just so yeah. annoying <laughs> i know this thank yes. you <laughs> yeah, it's it, it, no attention to that arc. So when we were doing Cortana, the the discovery arc I was working on was uh, after you've done a touch scenario, giving you a way to say like, you know, passively just on the screen, like, hey, did you know you can do this in voice too? Use this utterance to do exactly what you just did. Um, it It's not like pop up in your face. It's on the same screen that's confirming what you just completed. But we know it's something that might be useful to you because you just completed that task, that specific task as opposed to like it looks like you might be trying to write a document mm. like the uh, okay well uh, just let me do my thing just just don't don't get mm. in my way clippy don't don't do that mm. clippy's having a bit of a resurgence they, they they somebody was giving away clippy stickers in my last year at my at microsoft I'm like what's happening oh really <laughs> maybe that was the first sign that everything was going to go topsy-turvy once yes. like clippy started becoming hip again i should have known that we were in the the upside down <sighs> You see, it's the eighties. They're they're back. Yeah, yeah. They're popular they again. They are. People people are too young. This is the problem. They don't remember it. So suddenly clip <laughs> is trendy don't again. Know. No, they they just didn't live it. Oh <laughs> the pain. And I think the last piece of advice for everyone, of course, is to read your book. I mean, I, I got a lot out of it and I think that 
especially now I'm working in healthcare, there are so many devices there and so much happening with, with sensors and stuff that, I mean, it's so important to get it right. Such an interesting mm -hmm. space. Mm -hmm. I can't wait to hear more mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. how you apply some of this stuff <laughs> if you do in, in your work, maybe on a future podcast I listen to, but. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. It's been really good fun talking to you today, Cheryl. Thank you, James. Thank you, Pear. Thank it was you. a delight to come and talk to you. Well, first up, in the heat of that interview, I realized that I called the little green man from Toy Story Minions. I mixed up my kind of animated, digital animated film references in one sentence. Sorry. Not okay, James. Not okay. Mm, must do better. <laughs> I have to say that, I mean, even though I myself, I think I avoid smart speakers a lot. And I, know, I know you, James, I don't, you don't even smart speakers either. Uh, nope. And I, for me, it's, I'm, I'm more wary of how they can be misused, even for abuse and stuff. So uh, that's, that's probably why I avoid them a lot. But it's also one of the reasons I'm hugely appreciative of, of Cheryl's attention to human messiness in her book, where she also talks about how people are not predictable and how they always exist within a space that can be noisy or quiet or a space where they're holding stuff or other things have their attention or their capabilities are constrained. And so being able to observe and understand and map all that, that's the essence of doing UX work that's necessary to make technology, the technology to adapt to humans and not the other way around. So for me, that's the absolute imperative stuff to an ethical design approach that's really being communicated. Shared digital experiences is really tough. Mm. That's what we're talking about, isn't it? We're talking about, you know, normally, traditionally, in you know, computer interaction, you have a user, singular, and a computer, singular. Yeah. Whereas much of this we're talking about now is multiple users and multiple interfaces, and switching between interfaces, switching between users, and doing this seamlessly. Of course, it's complicated. Yeah, it's, it's it's bound to mess up. Yeah, it's doomed to fail. <laughs> God. Maybe, we'll, maybe, no. maybe we're at that point where it's too complex to get it right. <laughs> yeah, well, or, or I suppose the whole thing about you, you were racing along, too, so busy racing and, and running mm -hmm. that you, you don't have the time to, to, to stop and think about getting it right. Yeah. And, and some of the, the frameworks and tools in Cheryl's book is there to help you try and get it right, given the experience she's had working with multiple different um, voice platforms. Um, but it, it, I reflect as well on the time she mentioned a couple of times about um, something that she'd worked on has eventually made it into the product. And it, you know, listening back and thinking about the time aspects, mm. and she's referring to things maybe multiple years in the past that she'd helped research or design were starting to trickle through into products. Yeah. Which is a kind of good thing that it's taken that amount of time to kind of incubate and to develop. But when it comes out, it's still not quite good enough. Mm. So interesting about how much time we need to try and get this right and to process it. Exactly. Patience and humility is really important. Yeah, definitely. We have some recommended listening for you all and actually for me as well because this is uh, episode 207, uh, Designing Voice Interfaces with Ben Sauer. And I'm not even in that episode. Uh, so nope. I, I have to admit, I haven't listened back to it. <laughs> you see, that, that just means that for you, you've got to get out of jail card because you can't have kind of contradicted yourself or messed up what you said in Ben's interview when you're talking now with Cheryl and me. Whereas I kind of like, could have mm. fallen all over the place contradicting myself and making a mess of things. So I should listen back to it as well. <laughs> or read the transcript. Show notes, including a transcript, can be found on uxpodcast.com if you can't access them directly from wherever you are listening right now. So click follow, subscribe, add us if you aren't already doing so, and join us again for our next episode. And if you'd like to contribute to funding UX Podcast, then visit uxpodcast.com slash support. Remember to keep moving. See you on the other side.
the bow. Why did half a chicken cross the road? I don't know, James. Why did half a chicken cross the road? To get to its other side. <laughs> oh, no. I love the macabre. That's the mental picture of half a chicken. Did you did you picture the left half or the sec or the right half oh, or its awful. head or its feet? I don't know. I just wondered. But as another thing, connected to smart speakers, the amount of articles and things written about the smart speakers and jokes is incredible. There's this whole teams of writers working on the jokes for these speakers. Mm. It must be the biggest use case I think for these speakers. It probably is. That's amazing. Mm. Crazy. 